ops, and a little bit of paranoia. Welcome to the Iron Sysadmin Podcast. All right, welcome to tonight's show of the Iron Sysadmin Podcast. I'm your host, Nate, and I'm joined, as usual, by my co-host, Jason. Say hi, Jason. That's me. That's you. Uh, and our special guest for tonight is the one and only Mr. Ed Scotus. Good evening, Ed. Hey, hello, guys. <laughs> you guys might here. you guys might remember we had Ed on. I think it was last year, wasn't it? That's right. We'll talk yep. about Holiday Hack, and uh, since Holiday Hack is uh, hopefully either soon to be released or maybe even released by the time this show airs. Um, we thought we'd have him back on to chat about what's new for this year and uh, get everybody, uh, I don't know, maybe he'll drop some hints. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. Yeah. So for those of you who don't remember, um, Ed, you work for CounterHack, right? Did I get that right? Yeah, I got, CounterHack I got is it totally I, wrong. I created. Time. Right. Yep. Right. Um, and you guys put on Holiday Hack, and you also do, uh, you, you also, do, do you still do training for SANS? You were doing that for Oh, us? absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's the SANS Holiday Hack. So, you know, SANS sponsors it and SANS funds uh, the development of it. But it's my team over at CounterHack that puts it together. And uh, we've been doing this, I think, 16 or 17 years now. Um, and each year we get, you know, bigger and deeper and better and more skills on both the introductory level and the very technical level. And it's all free. I think that's a really important thing for everybody to know. It's all free. Yeah, so I, I like to talk it up on this show because um, as a sysadmin, or as as the listeners know, I'm not technically a sysadmin anymore, but I was until very recently. Um, as an operations person, um, I, I found the Holiday Hack Challenge to be just a whole lot of fun, and it got me exposed to some stuff that I didn't get to do from a normal day-to-day -day basis, and it really got you thinking like an attacker, um, which I think was really beneficial. So that's why we're having Ed back on to talk again about Holiday Hack, and I hope our listeners uh, go check it out again this year if they didn't last year. So. Yeah. yeah. One of the big differences this year, you know, we call it the, you know, the SANS Holiday Hack Challenge. And in the past, you know, a lot of the, the challenges were, were offensive. The majority of them were. But this year, like 80% of the challenges are defensive oriented. And, you know, really solid operations folks they they know the defense and they need to build those defensive skills. I mean, there's there's not that much of a line between being really solid at security and being really solid as a sysadmin ops person. You need both and they need to be able to work together and converse with each other, which is why I, I'm so excited when you invite me on the show. It's, it's really cool. <laughs> we think so too. I mean, I've, I've thought that for a very long time. And honestly, it's why I've been involved in uh, security as a, as sort of a side interest uh, on top of being an operations person because I agree I think it needs to be part of the ops role. Um, yeah. You don't necessarily I mean I get some places there's just too much work for a sysadmin to be also the security guy, but I think they need to have the mindset. I think so too, but I also think that the security people need to have the mindset of ops. If security people are making recommendations that are not operationalizable, if that's even a word. Right. then they're useless. They're completely useless. If an ops person says, there's no way this is realistic. I can't do this. Yeah. The security people have done them a disservice. They need to kind of show, no, this is realistic. Or if it's not, come up with something that actually is, you know? Right. This right. is where this is where I think DevOps becomes uh, a lot stronger now. Is yeah. Because you've, got, you've got security people in the mix. You've got um, developers in the mix. You've got operations folks in the mix. And, the, you know, the all three tiers kind of working together um, so you have direct feedback from the operations people saying, you know, to the developers, no, you can't do that because that's not, you know, that's not going to work because that's not secure. And then working with the security people to make sure that 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 whole tier is secured and that it makes sense and that it's operational and, and can be maintained. Isn't it amazing yes. this sort of DevOps revolution in the last, I don't know, five or eight years or whatever it's been. But how the hell did we do it before? You know, I mean, it's it's in right. retrospect, it's obvious that you should be doing it that way, that devs got to work with ops and security should be in the mix. No, but I, you know, we didn't. I, I worked at a web host where the development team was just in a room across the hallway, right? And I was essentially ops and security, even though we didn't really have security to speak of at the time. And I can remember them just like putting their files up on a Windows file share and like, okay, it's ready to go live. Just copy it over. And I knew nothing about what the application was supposed to do. They knew nothing about what the server was supposed to do. And it was just like, somehow we made it work. <laughs> yeah. It's a miracle. Yeah. 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 And you got to fill out the paperwork for security guys so that they can approve the ports being opened. And now you're got to do that. Now you're giving really this place, because, yeah. you're giving this place mm -hmm. way too much credit. There was no, 
<laughs> paperwork? What? Uh, other places have that, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, so. All right, so we already went off on a rabbit trail. So what can you tell us about Holiday Hack this year, Ed? So let's see. Um, we, launch is imminent. Uh, it's probably going to be in production by the time uh, listeners hear this, which is very exciting. The team's been working on it. The storyline for this year, every year we have a, an elaborate kind of story. But even if you're not in the stories, you should still play because it's just fun and interesting. But uh, the storyline, we've been working on that for the last 13 months. The storyline takes over a year in development. In fact, I'm working on the 2020 story now and have yeah. been for the last month. So the 2019 story is all together. And, and what Holiday Hack is, for those who may be unfamiliar with it, it it's, it's actually a cyber rage where you can go and practice your skills there's offensive stuff. There's a lot of defensive. Like I said, it's 80% defensive. But in addition to actual challenges where you interact with elves and they give you hints on how to solve them, there's the actual technical challenges that you get to do. It's also got a video game component where you walk around this little world and gather assets that you can use. And if you're not into video games, hey, that's fine. It's easy enough to get around this world. Um, but if you are into video games, it's kind of fun. Or I always like to say you can outsource the video game playing to a child. You know, have, have a young person in your life Say, hey, I need this asset. Hey, talk to this elf about this thing. Hey, do that. They can bring all the stuff together and you do that. So you've got the challenges, which are the best challenges we can create. My team works so hard on those. We've got the storyline. We've got the video game. We release an album of custom holiday music every year. The album's good, done. Good music, too. Excited about it. Well, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> we have um, some of the best DJs in uh, you know the, the cybersecurity hacker world. We've got uh, Count Ninjala. He mixes up a bunch of stuff for us every year. Keith yeah. Myers. Dual Core, uh, the rap group, um, they put together a, a nice track for us this year. And my son, uh, Joshua Scotus, did a really kind of haunting piece this year that I think you'll really like. That's cool. So, uh, so we got the album. Um, and it's also a social thing uh, where people go and, and you can have chats with each other. Or sometimes people get together in, in physical places like, a, you know, at a company, maybe five or eight or ten people get together and spend lunchtime or maybe an evening. Or they'll go out to a bar, a LAN party at a bar playing Holiday Hack. We're all into that. In fact, it was just announced today that uh, there is going to be a New York City um, get together where they have a room big enough for 200 people. Wow. And uh, it's going to be Tuesday, December 17th in New York. Uh, the event is on Eventbrite. And uh, a couple hundred people are going to get together and play Holiday Hack Challenge. And, and Sands just announced that Sands is not organizing this. This is done by somebody else. Sands is making Holiday Hack, but other people yeah. are organizing the playing of this. Um, Sam's going to buy pizza for him, which I think nice. is kind of cool. Nice. Yeah, so 200 people playing Holiday Hack, listening to the music. I wish I could be there, but I'm going to be down at a Sam's event when that happens. Yeah. Oh. On the uh, on the 20th, I have a, uh, because I'm a remote worker now, we have a bunch of us remotees get together for like a co-working day. Um, yeah. Maybe I'll have to convince them to uh, to let let me play Holiday Hack with them on a, yeah. <laughs> on a big screen or something. Or two. Yeah. I, you know, <laughs> it's fun. And I tell you, there's a lot of organizations do this. A lot of the banks do this. Um, a lot of military organizations, I know that the Air Force, the Army, uh, they have big groups that get together and, and work on Holiday Hack together. Um, I know that the NSA does this. They got a bunch of groups down there that do it. Yeah. Uh, the FBI does it. In fact, I, I've heard it said, and this makes me really happy. It might sound bad, but it makes me happy to hear. They say if you're going to do like a worldwide cyber attack and you don't want to get noticed, the, way, the, the time to do that is when we launch Holiday Hack because everybody's looking at Holiday Hack. So. Right. You're pretty much home free if you do it then. So that means over the next, uh, you know, 42, 48 or 72 hours, uh, that's that's prime time for us. So for everybody needs, needs to keep a better eye on their, their systems during uh, during the holiday hack launch. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. <laughs> and it's coming, coming so soon. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Cool. So, so it's got all these different components in it. And another, another interesting thing this year, uh, you know, Santa Claus experiments with a lot of new technologies. And he's been working a lot with machine learning. Uh, he and the elves over the past uh, year have done a lot with machine learning. And we have a couple of machine learning challenges in this year's Holiday Hack. One is an offensive machine learning where you're going to have to set up a, a neural network and train it up uh, and then have it uh, essentially perform an attack for you. And if you don't know how to do that, no problem. You click on some elves and they'll start giving you hints and directing you to articles that you can read so you can see how to set that up. And uh, so that's offensive uh, machine learning. We also have a defensive a machine learning thing where uh, some bad guys, I can't get into the details of the plot, but some bad guys are trying to uh, poison some data sources 
that are going into a machine learning, you got to figure out how that poison's getting in there wow. and start blocking the poison data feeds. Because I mean, if your machine learning is, is being taught by bad data feeds, sure, you're, it, it's going to go wrong, right? Sure. sure. So, um, so that's so that's I, kind of a fun twist. I have to say that that uh, n- not to interrupt your your uh, your monologue there, but <laughs> oh, good, sorry, this, sorry. This is probably what I like the most about Holiday Hack. So I've 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 done a couple challenges on things like Hack the Box, which are yeah. purely technical, right? Um, just kind of for fun to see what I could do. But the difference with Holiday Hack is that it's so much more of a learning tool than yeah. just a uh, a capture the flag contest. Yeah. which is really what I appreciate most about what you're doing with Holiday Hack. Well, thank you. We really try to make it that, you know, there is a competitive aspect to it. You can yeah. win. We, ha- we have a couple of prizes. You know, a grand prize is a, a free live SANS class. Uh, another grand prize we have is a free online SANS class. Uh, we have subscriptions to our Cyber Range product, uh, NetWars. There's three of those that are available. But, I mean, we had 17,000 people play. The chances that you're going to win are pretty small. No offense. Please yeah. play. Yeah. I'm really excited yeah. about it. But, but the reason to play, I think, is for the fun aspect of it and the learning aspect of it, and as well as the social aspect. Um, you know, meeting other people, we try to make the game so that you can meet other folks. And people always ask me, how, how, if we want to play as a team, how, how big can our team be? And my answer is, I, I don't care. If yeah. you want to play, you know, single, two people, 10 people, you want to get a, you know, a high school class of 30 kids playing together, 100 people, it doesn't matter really to us at all because it's just all about the learning. So, yeah. I mean, it's, it is at Elf so, University this year, right? So, That's right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you brought that up. So last year, for maybe, maybe some of your listeners played, and we, we held it at you know Santa's Castle because we figured Santa Claus is uh, hosting the thing. So we had 17,500 people show up at Santa's Castle, and it was packed. I mean, it felt kind of like DEF CON, you know, where <laughs> people have trouble moving in the halls and everything. It was, it was intense. Um, so this year... We looked, uh, you know, Santa was looking for the biggest venue at the North Pole and happens to be Elf University, Elf U for short. Um, and people usually chuckle when we say Elf U, right? So, uh, <laughs> so anyway, you'll be at Elf U and it's, it's a lot bigger than Santa's castle. Uh, and it's really cool because you'll see, I mean, this is where elves go to learn, you know, merriment and holiday cheer and all hmm. that kind of stuff, uh, making toys. I always wonder. Um, yeah, that's right. It's Elf U. And, and you get to see the elves and there's, there's the, the student elves and the professor elves. Um, and you get to interact with the elves and they help you out. And you have to help the elves out. Um, and and I, I mean, I'll tell you, the basic storyline is this. Um, the theme of this year, we, we call it Kringle Con. Last year was, was the first Kringle Con where there's an actual conference at the North Pole with some fantastic speakers. This year, we're hosting at Elf U, Kringle Con 2, Turtle Doves. So that, that, the theme <laughs> is the Turtle Doves. We figure we can milk that for another 11 or so. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> yeah, so Kringle Con two turtle doves, and the turtle doves are the mascot of the conference. But the, the the turtle doves are gone. They've been abducted, kidnapped. They flew away. We don't know. And when you walk into the game, Santa says, "I need you to help find the turtle doves." And this is, to, I mean, from a gaming perspective, this is to, to encourage you to kind of explore. It's not that hard to find the turtle doves. But once you find the turtle doves, then the story starts to open up. And you'll start to see the nefarious activities that are happening, try to figure out who the bad guy is, because there's always somebody that's trying to destroy the holiday season. Of course. Yeah. So <laughs> of course. are there gonna be are there gonna be talks this year? Like there were yep. last year? Yep, there's gonna be talks. We got amazing talks. Um, we're gonna have uh, just really incredible stuff. We've got uh, uh, Leslie Carhart is uh, presenting. We've got uh, Deviant Olaf is presenting on some physical security stuff. Hmm. Really cool. We've got um, Snow is presenting. She does some amazing hacking. Uh, Mark Baggett is going to be there. Uh, also, uh, John Strand, who does really incredible stuff with Black Hills. Yeah, we got a. Re- I'm, I'm really happy with the speakers and so thankful um, that they're all coming out to do that. Uh, yeah, yeah, and and all of the uh, the videos will be inside Elf University. So you walk into the various tracks. It's a seven track conference. So you walk into a track and there'll be a talk going on, and you can see that talk. I'll give you a little secret. Don't tell anyone. The tracks are also all on YouTube, so you can just watch them on YouTube as well. There's a KringleCon channel. They're going to be released very soon. Some people like to watch them inside Elf U, you know, in the, in the track rooms. Other people just watch them on YouTube, and we're happy. And the talks, not all of them, but all the talks by my team members, uh, they're hints for the challenges as well. And uh, my team posted a couple of blog articles over the last couple of days. Those are hints, too. 
So, right. you know, anything my team does in late November and early December, that's all for holiday hack. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, last yeah. year, um, I started watching the talks right around launch time. And I remember there was a little bit of, little bit of glitchiness when, uh, when things first kicked off just because it was the new engine and you know, whatever. Um, yes. so I ended up, yep. I ended up watching them all on YouTube, just like as I was working, I put them on in the background and I'm listening to them. Um, but it was really neat to just like walk into a room in the game <laughs> essentially yeah. and have yeah. the talk play and see other people hanging out. It was pretty cool. That's cool. Yeah. We're hoping that the glitchiness, uh, you know, associated with uh, last year's launch, which took a couple of days for us to sort out. We're hoping knock on wood that, uh, that this year's is smoother. We've been working super, super hard on it and it's looking pretty solid, but you never know. I mean, you know, I said we had 17,500 people at any given time. There's thousands and thousands of people hitting it. And, uh, we run it all on Google compute with a mm -hmm. bunch of Docker images. Um, you know, there's a lot of Redis uh, message passing and such on the back end. And it, it is a comp complex piece of engineering that's actually happening there. And uh, yeah, that's why, you know, every year, uh, let me tell you guys something. Every year, people, every, everybody wants, what is the date? When will it launch? Yeah. I need to know the date. Yeah. And, you know, this year we're interacting with a lot more marketing people and things like that. And they say, you got to have a date. You got to have a date. It's really hard to... To do it, a hard uh, it goes live when it's ready, right? <laughs> well, it's, 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 that is part of it because we're not exactly sure when it's going to be ready. But secondly, if I said it's up now, then 10,000 people click refresh. Right. And that's, that's hard to survive with a complex technology stack on the back end. You saw what happened you know, to Disney Plus, right? When it launched. Yeah. A few weeks, it melted down over the first couple of hours. And that's Disney, right? And they're charging money for their stuff. Yeah. So. So, you know, our stuff, uh, we, we work hard to keep it as solid as, as we can, um, but we always do a soft launch. So the soft launch is we test and test and test, 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 and then we just turn it on and we don't tell anybody. And people start finding it on Twitter and this and that. And we let the soft launch go for 24 or 48 hours and then we announce it when we feel that we're ready. We'll watch it go from 10 users to 100 users to 1,000 users to 2,000 users. And if we're still solid, then boom, then it's hard launch time. But... Uh, We've always done a soft launch. I know that kind of frustrates people, but it's to deal with the onslaught to make sure we're stable. And also it gives us a little bit of wiggle room on the time. All the pros do that though. I mean, yeah. I, it's Jason and I will probably talk about it later in the show, but I recently purchased, uh, I don't know if you've heard of this game streaming service that Google launched Stadia. Mm, I haven't um, heard of it. Mm. It's, it's basically like you can stream 4k games on a Chromecast. Right, Whoa. right, right to a TV, it's and it's it's I mean, really neat technology. And I I pre-ordered one, and everybody was complaining about launch day, because mm -hmm. you know there's a lot to go on there, right? Yeah. But they did a similar thing where they didn't let people in until they got their welcome packet, and their welcome packet had a code in it. So you could call that a a soft launch, right? They didn't let huh. they didn't unleash it to everybody at the same time, and they're Google. Yes, <laughs> right? and they're I Google. mean, come on. <laughs> Yeah. So I should add, I should add to be, to be fair and true. Google is a sponsor of uh, holiday hack challenge. They essentially donate uh, Google compute cycles to us yeah. for the month of December and early January. That's we really pay cool. for it the rest of the year. The yeah. rest of the year comes out of my pocket, but uh, very thankful during our peak times, December and early January, yeah. uh, Google donates that time to us. Um, but we keep it up year round. So if you ever want to practice or build your skills, they're all up. 2015 Holiday Hack Challenge, 2016, 2017. We keep them up year round at, just to help people learn. It's just practice, practice, practice. You know, you, oh, you've got to uh, deal with security issues in Node.js. Well, Holiday Hack Challenge 2015 is all built on Node and uh, it gets the you know crap hacked out of it all the time. So, <laughs> so that is part of the challenge, right? So, uh, or, or other different technologies. And we also post all the answers. So all the answers from the previous year's challenges are up. So you can read those, benefit from them, implement them, practice, practice, practice. Yeah, it's pretty cool so, stuff. So I, you talked about some of the some of the tech that you're using this year. Um, yeah. Containers, uh, Redis is a, is a sort of a messaging bus type type technology. What uh what yep. are, what is the majority of this written in? Oh, it's it's written in a whole bunch of different technologies. Um, it's. I mean, there's there's the gaming engine itself, but then a lot of the back end is done in um, 
in various uh, Python. I mean, we've got a lot of Python that's holding the challenges together. There's a huge amount of JavaScript. I mean, JavaScript is right. I mean, it's it's in everything. It's the lingua franca of of the web. Um, so there's a lot of that. Um, it's actually interesting. A lot of the stuff that we're delivering right to the browser is just CSS and HTML5 because we want to be as browser independent as possible. Yeah. Um, we do find some strange glitches. We had one today. One of our challenges delivered in an iframe looks beautiful on the screen, except for in Firefox. In Firefox, what happens is there's this little box on the screen. It's, it's essentially, you know, your, your UX, your user experience, and you see it. And then in Firefox, it turns itself upside down, zooms <laughs> away, and then zooms back in and continues to get bigger and bigger and bigger. It was, it was an error in the way it was implementing the JavaScript resize in the iframe. Wow. But it looked, it looked actually cool as heck, but you couldn't <laughs> actually interact with the GUI yeah. because it's constant. <laughs> it was crazy. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's, That's interesting. It's pretty neat. Yeah, but yeah, but I mean, not, you know, HTML5 is a, interoperable. HTML5 it's is not standard, completely interoperable. Right? So. Yeah, <laughs> I wish, yeah. I wish. Uh, we we run into a little weirdness in Firefox. Um, you know, I most of us are testing it in Chrome. Um, I test it in Safari uh, too because I'm a Mac guy, and I know some of the senior leadership at Sans uses Macs, and I have I have this idea that I hope they look at it. I don't know if they do, but I hope they right. do. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. And then it, it works on the phone. The only issue, you know, so Android or, or iOS, the only issue there is the keyboards are a little tough to use uh, sometimes when you've got a command line on the yeah, phone. Right, right. But, uh, you know, on, a, on an iPad or an Android tablet, it's, it's, it's okay. It's reasonable. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Pretty cool. I can't imagine somebody performing a hacking challenge on their phone, but I, I'm sure people do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I tell you, and there's, you know, there's also, you know, there's very, there's Slack channels that people put together mm -hmm. uh, to interact with that. And sometimes I'll pop into some of the, the bigger ones. Um, you know, there's Reddit uh, discussions uh, about holiday hack that happen every year. And, you know, we, we look at those and, and monitor them and try to try to help out because really it's about learning. Um, I tell you, it's, it's the funnest thing to be able to run these things. And it's, it's crazy. Uh, as I consider how this is, has grown and taken off. I mean, I used to do them myself. I would write it in an afternoon, release it pretty much the day I wrote it or the next day. And, you know, we'd have a couple hundred people that would participate. And, you know, now I've, if you look at the entire team that worked on this, it's probably 25 or 30 people. Wow. Uh, we've got, we've got graphics artists. We have a differentiation of graphics artists. There's graphics artists that work on video game components. We've got a character artist on this. We've got uh, a, sort of a line artist that can do logos and things like that. Um, musicians, we have multiple musicians involved. Challenge writers, there's about 10 or 12 or 15 of those. Video game programmer. Um, it's, it's just crazy. I write the storylines. I mean, I, I tell you, Santa Claus kind of tells me what's happening. Wait till you see next year's. Oh my gosh, next year's story is crazy, crazy. I think you said that uh, last year too. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true. I'm, I'm like all into next year's story. I mean, this year we got to get the launch, yeah. right? But I'm, my, my brain is is wrapping around next year's story. Yeah, there's a cliffhanger at the end of this one, by the way. Oh, that's you've got cool. if you get to the end, you got to see that cliffhanger. So, so these these artists and video game programmers and whatnot are they? Is this what they do full time, or are they uh, are they also in the security industry? And this is sort of a side side gig. So, so. Um, my team does this as you know part of our work in building cyber ranges for SANS. So that's my team. But there's a lot of people outside of my team. The artists and such, those are, are essentially contractors. And we contract with them separate from Holiday Hack to do things like you know Net Wars, our cyber range stuff. So they, they do work with us on other projects uh, for pay. We do pay them for this work. Oh, that's my office going off. It goes off at the top of every hour. Um, <laughs> just so you know, it's, uh, it's the tone of Big Ben. Uh, I, I, I don't know if we've talked about my office before, but I wrote about 30,000 lines of code uh, that does a bunch of IoT stuff so that my office feels kind of like you're, it's alive. Um, so it's going to, here it goes, and my lights are going to kind of flicker and you see it. There we go. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so it does it at the top of every hour. Um, nice. At the bottom of every hour, it rings jingle bells um, just because it's Why the holiday not? season. Yeah. <laughs> so, so anyway, um, so yes, these, these folks that are working on this, now we do have some volunteers, some people just say, Hey, we want to help. We don't want pay. And that's pretty cool too. Um, you know, for the music, I commission that. So I actually pay 
the musicians for it. And then with respect to the licensing on the music, I tell the musicians, you can do whatever you want with it and I can do whatever we want with it. So essentially it's a fork, right? You own it. I own it. I can remix it, redo whatever I want with it. You can do the same and I'm paying them to write it. Um, you know, I, I'll, I'll give them some ideas. I want them the vibe to be kind of like this. I want it to feel like that. And then they make it up uh, for us. Um, so this year, I, I think you're going to really like the music. Several of the, the folks that have been beta testing for us say that they love how the music is really tied into the room that it's in. And there's also a huge diversity of music this year. We got a lot of different types. So. Yeah, in the in the 2016 challenge that I was so familiar with, um, the music really set the tone. I mean, you, you'd walk into a room, you'd feel the music, and it, it really like just everything was so well put together that year. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I appreciate that. That was electro swing music we were looking for. Yeah, except for the, the 1978 thing. We were looking for a little bit of a disco vibe there. Yeah. It seemed right. You know? yeah. yeah. So yeah, it was good stuff. I was thinking this morning. Um, about the diversity of motives of the attackers in Holiday Hack Challenge. In 2015, it was Cindy Lou Who. Mm -hmm. And her motive was she was psychologically twisted when she was two years old because of the Grinch. So that was 2015. 2016, it was Doctor Who. And Doctor Who was trying to suppress the release of the 1978 Star Wars movie because it was a blight on the universe. So Doctor Who was trying to make the universe a better place. 2017, it was Glinda the Good Witch, who was a war profiteer. Uh, 2018, it was Hans Gruber from Die Hard, and uh, he was actually being employed by Santa Claus to try to find talent to help secure the North Pole. So, and then this year, there's a, a, an entirely different motive. I hadn't realized that we had a different motive every year until I was thinking about it, and that makes me kind of happy too. Um, and you know, we do try to have a lot of diversity in in our our bad guys and our good guys, the characters and so forth. Um, you know, to represent. I think that's that's reasonable and appropriate. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you just you guys do a pretty good job with it. I mean, it uh, the just the way everything comes together, the the story, the music, the the world, um, just the it's very immersive. Just well, just you. the way everything seems to seems to fit in. Yeah, I appreciate that. You know, sometimes we'll get some some people will say, "Look, uh, I don't I don't want the video game piece. Can you not do that?" can't you just write challenges? Just give me challenges. And you know, there's great things out there for challenges like over yeah. the wire you talk about. And, and there's just some really, really great stuff. We we're not trying to do that. Like you even said, Nate, uh, our focus is really not the competitive aspect of it. Although that's there because some people like it. Sure. Our focus is, is the learning and the education and the sharing and really trying to have people network with each other. It's very easy in our industry, and I, I say our industry, you know, cybersecurity, but but sysadmin as well, operations, to be isolated by technology. I've been thinking about this a lot. The the promise of all these sort of social technologies and and Zoom and video conferencing and such was that we'd be closer, right? We'd be able to communicate, and that's going to make the world a better place. Yep. It almost seems like the opposite. Mm -hmm. I, I got to say, it seems like we're more at each other's throats, and there's a lot more hate and anger going around now even though these technologies are supposed to be bringing us closer, I'm not so sure about that. So what we're really trying to do with Holiday Hack is to encourage people to work together, to meet friends, to meet like-minded individuals, um, and do that in a, a positive, happy way. There's another interesting aspect of, of Holiday Hack. We have a dirty word filter. Now, dirty word filters are inherently easy to bypass, obviously. You just come up with different dirty words. Sure. Um, sure. But we, you know, we need to have it because a lot of little kids play the, play the game and such. Um, but if you type in a dirty word, and this is not me throwing down the gauntlet to, to all of your audience to see if you can evade our filter, but it replaces any bad words that you say with the word Kringle. So if you ever see somebody wandering around the Holiday Hack Challenge universe and they're saying Kringle, 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 <laughs> they're swearing, actually. <laughs> um, yeah, but, you know, it's, 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 it's crazy. It's very interesting. Um, you know, we have some guys on my team that are video gamers and they'll, they'll bring a lot of that experience to this, but we also want to make something that even if you're not a video game person, you, you'll find compelling and interesting and educational. So there's that tough balance that we're trying to, to hit there. We're not creating a video game for video games pur uh, purposes. Um, so, we're trying to create uh, reality. So when do you think uh, holiday hack challenge is going to require an Oculus uh, helmet? 
<laughs> We've talked about that. In fact, uh, you know, what was it? Two, three years ago when Pokemon Go first came uh -huh. out, we were like, can we implement something that does sort of like an augmented reality overlay through your camera that you look in and you see an elf pop in or something like that? We've talked about that. Um, it's probably a little ways off. There's so much more that has to be done, but yeah. Uh, we're bu building on the same engine um, we did last year, but we've extended the engine and added a lot of new capabilities yeah. that I think uh, people will really like. So, yeah, I, yeah. I, I really liked the the feel of the what was it browser quest you got you guys used a number of years ago. Um, yeah, we did. Like to yeah. the to the point where I got curious about it, and I went and found browser quest and and tried to run it myself. Then I mm -hmm. realized why you guys wanted to get away from it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's neat, such a, but yeah, <laughs> such a it, mess. It, it, it really is. It's a complicated mess and you can only go so far with it. Yeah. Uh, we went pretty far with it. Yeah. Um, but then we decided to kind of roll our own engine. Um, it, but browser quest is great for creating real simple mm -hmm. games. And, but uh, we really wanted to kind of push things and, and, and massive multiplayer kind of stuff, of, you know, thousands of people. Uh, there's some new functions that I'm going to need to tell the 2020 story. Um, that we're going to start implementing right after this year's done. I, I told our video game main designer, that's Evan Booth, I said, so soon as we launch and everything's going smoothly, I want you to start developing some features we need for the story, which I think is actually kind of cool. So the storyline's driving our video game development. Yeah. It's also, and, and challenges are driving storyline. I mean, it's all deeply integrated. Josh Wright, he's, he's one of my guys uh, that's in charge of the challenge planning. And the guy's just amazing. He's awesome. I work on the storyline. Josh works on the challenge planning. And then Evan does the world. And then there's a whole bunch of other people that build underneath that. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, I the idea that you control all of the code base for the game engine probably makes things a lot, uh, a lot easier for development because it's all yours. And it's... It is. Um, you know, there's, there's been, I'll be honest with you, some controversy on my team about, you know, should we just use an established base because that's how we started out or should we use our own? We have such great flexibility with our own. Um, last year was very tough, though, because our main developer uh, got sick oh. for a few weeks. And, um, you know, if you're using your own code base, it's awfully hard. What do you do? You, you could contract that, but somebody else doesn't know the code base very well. Right. So... So that's tough. If you're building off of sort of, you know, an industry standard uh, gaming engine, then you can contract in if you need it. Um, so it is a tough thing. We made the call to stay on our same engine this year. And I think that's proven to be good for us. Still, knock on wood, we don't know. We're going to turn it into production soon. But uh, but yeah, that's that was a tough call. We spent a lot of January 2019 looking at other code engines and trying to decide which way should we go. Yeah, I got to imagine there's there's plenty out there, but the the question comes down to the flexibility. But I I guess if it's an engine designed to let you to design a game, it's supposed to be flexible, right? So yeah. the question is yeah. how flexible, and can you build yeah, those challenges in the way that you're doing it? Right. Yeah, you get into licensing costs and everything too. Yeah, that is yeah. true. Yeah, yeah, because you know we don't we don't know how much we're going to scale. Um, yeah, there's there's so many things going on. And, but I really would like, even if people don't want to play the challenges, which I hope uh, your your viewership would, I do hope they'll uh, they'll come and at least watch the talks. There's great talks. You know, we were talking about some of the speakers that are going to be there. Uh, Ian Coldwater is going to be there talking about Kubernetes hmm. um, and some of the security issues associated with that, which I think every sysadmin should become familiar with, not only Kubernetes, but also the security issues that they entail. Uh, Chris Davis from my team is going to be doing an interesting talk. Uh, on some machine learning stuff. So uh, that, that I think will prove at least interesting to people and perhaps useful. Uh, just a lot of, lot of really cool talks coming. We, we also did try to, to reach beyond just cybersecurity folks in our talks and, uh, and really try to get some operations issues uh, that are covered. I like so. that there's defensive focused things in the challenges here. I, I don't remember, maybe there were some last year, but I, I don't really remember, maybe I didn't get that far. Um, there are a few. Last year was maybe 20, 30 percent defense and the rest yeah. offense. This year we flipped it. I remember we there was like a log analysis one, which was kind of def kind of defense. And yeah, lots, lots of log analysis this year. There's um, stuff on, uh, you know, Deep Blue CLI, which is fantastic Windows log analytics tool. Uh, there's a great tool called Rita, uh, mm -hmm. which, puts, uh, you know, packet captures and, and uh, Zeek logs and things like that. Um, great challenge on that. And uh, there's some gray log. There's a gray log challenge that we've got. 
uh, some Splunk stuff. Splunk's fantastic uh, for for analyzing large data sets. Lots of there's a lot of that this year. It's good and um, there's information to go along with these things about how to use them. Not not yep. just throw you off the deep end and say here. Uh, use this tool you've never seen. <laughs> That's exactly right. Yep. Either there'll be talks right. or there will be links within the challenge itself to articles that we've all written so yeah. that you can understand how to do it. Or you just click on a little elf and the elf, Some most of the times the elves will say, I'm having trouble with my computer here. Can you help me? You help the elf with a computer in a way that takes five or 10 minutes. And then the elf starts giving you clues on how to solve the bigger challenge. So- and and we even tell you, you get a badge, you know, like a like a conference mm-hmm. badge, and your badge is an electronic badge, and it will tell you which elf to find to help you solve which challenge. So oh, the that's badge cool. is like, yeah, your navigation there. That's cool. So it, that's cool. Yeah, it's fun. I designed the badges this year. Cool. How about that? Yeah, <laughs> it's all about the badge life, right? <laughs> there it is. I'm happy with the badges. They look like uh, you know, those little round peppermint things with the red and white stripe. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's, that, cool. that's what I did. I made a circle that had red and white stripes. Oh, good. Well, I mean, getting, <laughs> getting those spiraled stripes just right, that's... You got it. That's got to yes. be a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, that's, right. that's, that's way past my artistic talent. Oh, man. Um, At the edge of mine, I'm telling you. <laughs> so so how much how much of the... How many... I guess looking at it from um, OS-specific uh, challenges, yeah. I know there, there was a bunch of, of Windows stuff last year. Um, yep. and, I, and I get it. Windows is big enough, unfortunately, that it's kind of the the landscape yeah. that most most uh, uh, security people are dealing with. Um, what's the what's the sort of balance this year? Is this, I assume it's still majority is Windows. But no, no, there's a lot of Linux uh, this year. Most of our terminal challenges are Linux. The terminal challenges are the one ones where you go and solve a small problem so that the elf gives you big hints on bigger problems. Uh, those are mostly Linux, not all. Um, so, you know, there's there's a dozen of those. Then there's a dozen what we call grand challenges. And the grand challenges, I'd say, are probably 40% Windows, maybe 30%, 30 to 40% Windows, let's say. Another 30% Linux. And then the remaining, say, 30 to 20%, depending on how you count, are web. Hmm. So, so there's a pretty good mix between. It's not, it's not a, a, an overwhelming amount of Windows this year, but we do have the Deep Blue CLI. We do have. We, you might see PowerShell on non-traditional platforms this year, which is kind mm. of fun, I think. <laughs> you know, PowerShell just isn't Windows these days. Yeah, so, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Santa Claus is into all kinds of things. I just got to say, <laughs> that's good. I, I did. I mean, that that was one of the things that I think struck me most about the challenges that I had that I was able to complete is that they were Linux based. And yeah. that's my for, that's my forte. I've been a Linux admin for 15 years or more. Um, I've been using Linux since like the late 90s somewhere. So that was like really like, oh, good, it's Linux. I can do this. <laughs> I got this. Yeah. Like I don't yep. care if I know what I'm doing just yet. I can figure this one out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of the, the terminal challenges. There's a lot of Linux for those. Like 80. percent Yeah. Um. Yeah. And then the web stuff gets pretty darn interesting. Um. You know, we have one of our more advanced challenges is very web centric. And then there's some, you know, there's some network stuff, too, where you've got to, you know, implement some uh, filtering rules with IP tables and things like that. There's just a huge diversity of challenges. Yeah. We brainstorm through them. Josh Wright maintains this list. You know, we brainstorm through what each one is trying to teach and what kind of lessons you're learning from them so we can have that diversity. And we also try to structure the game you know, principles of gamification so that you can kind of work on what you want to work on and say, look, I don't want to touch the Windows stuff. You can focus on Linux. Stuff. I mean, to get all the way through, you got to get all the way through. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. But if you want to start on the Linux, we got a lot of that. You want to start on the Windows, we want it to be very easy for you to figure out which ways you can go to work on the technologies you want to work on. Additionally, in your badge, it'll tell you the relative difficulty of each challenge. That's based on our understanding. Because, you know, from gamification perspective, maybe you're newer and you don't want to work on the really hard ones. But if you don't know which ones are the really hard ones, you might be working on one that you're not capable of doing yet. Right. So your badge will say, this is an easy one. This is an easy one. This is this one's intermediate. This one gets harder. And it's actually, it's a series of five Christmas trees. And however many Christmas trees are filled in, that's how hard it is. Hmm. So if there's one Christmas tree filled in, difficulty one. If there's five filled in, that's our hardest challenge, right? Uh, and I did ask the team, I instructed them this year, and I think they did it. 
to increase the on-ramp so that there's more simpler challenges, especially with the increasing number of kids that are yeah. playing. There's also still a, a large number of very difficult, very complex challenges. Um, but we want that on-ramp to be real nice and smooth. Another chart that we do uh, every year, you know, for me and the team, and we present this publicly too, um, we do sort of like an after-action review of Holiday Hack Challenge, is considering all the challenges we have, you know, what percentage of, of our players get through challenge one? and two, and three, and four. And we're looking for sort of a smooth drop-off and not a spike that goes down. It's like right. that challenge everybody's butt, nobody got it. Yeah. We want it to come. In. And I'm actually very pleased to say, I don't know if we're just lucky or, or what, but I'll take it, right? Um, we've had very smooth uh, sailing and not like one challenge that just crushed everybody. Usually our hardest challenge is the last one. And, uh, you know, we'll have something like, you know, 90% of players get the first challenge. And maybe two or three percent of players get the hardest challenge, and it's usually pretty smooth on the way down. Um, but it's it's always a crapshoot because things that you think are going to be easy, people find hard. People yeah. think things that you find hard, somebody looks at it in a kind of a weird, different way, and they find this trivial way to solve it. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, okay, well, good for you, you solved it. But you know, we didn't think we of just, that. We just had that. So the the DEFCON group that I was talking to you about before the show started recording, uh, DEFCON 610, yeah. that Jason is also one of the admins. And we, nice. uh, last month, I think it was, yeah, it was early, mid, it was mid-November. Uh, we finally kicked off the first year of our, we, we've designed this hacker pub crawl where we got oh, a bunch nice. of Raspberry Pis and we got the agreement of a number of, of pubs in the Eastern area and we put these at different places. And then we had people come and just basically go from restaurant to restaurant and try to complete these challenges. And um, one of them, I actually got to take a crack at, um, even though I was like at the central base, they brought them all back to the same place at one point. Anyway, um, I'm poking around at the thing and he's got all these challenges set up. And one of them was a web shell, which was relatively yeah. easy to get to. It was one of his easier challenges. So yeah, I got to yeah. the web shell and then he had like three other harder challenges that, he, that you had to get through. And you had to go through all these little hoops to get through that I didn't really understand. But I'm a Linux guy and he gave me a web shell. Yeah. So I just walked around all of them and found his flags. And he's yeah, like, no, yeah. how'd you do that? I'm like, well, you gave me a web shell. I'm going to use it. <laughs> so that's the sort of thing I'm sure that you're talking about where they yes. just like, oh, well, there's this really simple way to walk around the thing that the hoops you tried to make me go through, which is yeah. exactly what happened to this guy. So, it's, so um, true. it's so true. Yeah. But that's kind of exciting, too. And then sometimes people find zero days in... <laughs> In, in the software that we're using, not the stuff we created, but just the, uh, oh, I found a zero day. And you're like, well, crap, you win. I mean, what are you going to do? Yeah. Uh, sometimes people find vulnerabilities in our own code. Uh, that happens. Um, they've all been very, very cool about it in the past. You know, they, they say, hey, we found this issue, this flaw. Hey, thanks so much. We appreciate it. Let us fix it. And then you can disclose it and we'll tell everybody how great you are for finding it and being nice about telling us. Yeah. <laughs> um, so... Yeah, we've got a really good community of people that are that are playing this. It's it's really been wonderful to see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've um, in in the few smaller projects that I've done, like the hack your derby stuff and uh, and whatever that I did for DerbyCon, I've always mm. had you know like there's a scoreboard and there's flags, right? And I've always said, look, if you want to be that guy that breaks the scoreboard, good for you. You're just gonna ruin it for everybody else. Yeah, and we've right. always had generally good participation we've never had that guy come in and just like burn the place down right That's and good. it sounds like exactly. you've had you've had a similar experience at a much larger scale which makes me happy <laughs> yeah we have we have the people have been really really good uh, about it um and i hope that continues i really do you know we really are we really do sweat the details to try to make this a fun sort of community sort of family oriented thing you know, I go through all the challenge wording. So do, so do several folks on my team. We want to make sure nothing's offensive, nothing's particularly off color, you know, or anything like that. Um, you know, sometimes I'll say, look, th there's a double entendre here that I think is a little too much for us. I mean, the most we'll do is elf you, right? I mentioned elf you and that's a laugh line, right? Yeah. Um, but, but we really are careful. And I'll, you know, say to my team, this one I think might offend uh, somebody, this one seems a little bit too much. And we're trying to make the North Pole a nice, happy place. I tell you, we did have an issue. This was in Holiday Hack Challenge 2015. So it was the first time we did a video game. There were these people that were walking around spitting out 
because you know it's got Chad and a great chat, and they were spitting out vile, nasty stuff. Yeah, and um, you know this is terrible. And there's little kids all around, and they're just saying nasty, nasty things. We had a dirty word filter, but you know, I mean, it's easy to get around those things. So um, what uh, what we ended up doing is we shadow banned them, which was actually I gotta say comical because they were walking around the world spewing out this horrible racist sexual nonsense garbage mm-hmm. and they thought everybody could see them and everyone was shocked nobody could see anything they were saying except for us right <laughs> so, i'm like wow that's a really interesting feature um now it can obviously be abused but if you're in the north pole talking racist sexual garbage you, you know i think we have a, a and plus it's our environment that we built yeah. we have a reason uh you know method for filtering that kind of stuff and it made me sad too. I mean, what kind of person does that? Exactly. You know? yeah. yeah. It's just some people just want to watch the place burn. <laughs> it's yeah. just the way some yeah. people are. And that happened once in 2015. Um, not that I'm throwing down the gauntlet to have it happen again, right. but uh, it happened. We we figured it out and, and things went well. I tell you, my uh, sister in law used to be, uh, she worked for as a contractor for, I think it's Mattel or Hasbro. I forget which one it is, the, whichever one has Barbie. Mm hmm. And she would go into the Barbie online world and pretend to be a little girl who just got a Barbie and got access to the Barbie online world. And her job was to go in there and see if people said or did inappropriate things to her. And if they did, her job was to contact law enforcement. I'm I'm actually yeah. kind of glad that uh, someone's doing that, being a yeah, father of two right. little girls, <laughs> yeah, neither of amen. which are in the Barbie online world. But. <laughs> but but yeah, I mean, it is interesting these these online worlds and and what happens in them and and such like that, and then the need to kind of you know uh, keep an eye on things. It's it's again the social uh, aspect of it. We're trying to encourage the social aspect of it, but I guess with the social comes the antisocial, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's the problem the internet has had for as long as I've been on the internet, which is quite a while. Yeah, <laughs> you get true. that level of uh, anonymity and people just think they can say whatever they want. No one's ever going to know who they are and they can do whatever mm-hmm. they want. And But we've been we've been quite fortunate. I mean, the, the thing I mentioned, that's very much the exception. Um, so it's been really good and I hope it's, it stays that way. And, you know, also we I. Our hope is that there's some twists in the story and there's kind of delight, like, oh, I can't believe, you know, that this just happened or that, you know, there's like this, uh, you know, subtle suspense or plot or, oh, my gosh, wow, that's so weird. Um, and just wait until 2020. I'm telling you guys, you got to see it. It's going to be so weird. <laughs> well, look, we, I, I look forward to it every year, whether you, you're going to hype it or not. So <laughs> no. hey, hopefully, hopefully we, you hook a couple of listeners with it. <laughs> I, I really do appreciate this opportunity to reach out to folks. I mean, again, this is a gift. We don't make any money on this. We do it because we want to help people yeah. and we have fun with it. Um, so really, I hope, uh, I hope your, your viewers, your listeners, uh, do try it. It's at holidayhackchallenge.com. Um, and it's as long as, uh, our launch goes smooth, it should be up for them right now. Holidayhackchallenge.com. That's pretty cool. So yeah, we've, uh, we've kept you for like almost an hour at this point. So, uh, if you have any, th- any final thoughts you want to give out for holiday hack and then we'll let you get on with your evening. Nope. I just hope people do enjoy it. And, uh, Hey, my many thanks to, uh, the sysadmins, the ops people in the world, you keep our world running. You really do. And uh, that's pretty awesome. I'm glad you have a community here, uh, you know, that uh, that is focused on the fine art of the care and feeding of computer systems to make sure that they operate for us all. Yes. I mean, if you th- it's usually oh, a pretty thankless job, but uh, thank it, you. It is. <laughs> that's why I'm trying to thank you for yeah. this thankless job. Yeah. Because, I mean, think about it. You guys keep the modern infrastructure yeah. of the world operational without you guys i mean forget about it there wouldn't be banking people would starve uh, military couldn't keep operating i mean ev- everything runs on the backs of our computers which are run on the backs of ops personnel yeah we've is- talked about it plenty of times on this show and that that is definitely a thing that a lot of people don't realize and that means we're doing our jobs so that's right yeah. <laughs> so so for most people it's just magic yeah, right yeah, magic right. Nothing, nothing. Right. Well, thank you guys. Much appreciated. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for coming Thanks, on. Man. It was relatively short notice. I just pinged you on Twitter and we set this up and that was cool. So, uh, yeah. Thanks for coming. Thanks for making the time. Awesome. Hey, thanks guys. Appreciate it, Jason. Thank you, Nate. You guys rock. You really do. Yeah. All thanks, right. Ed. Have a good one, Ed. Thanks, you Have too. Bye. All right.
right. A big thanks to Ed Scotus for joining us tonight to talk about Holiday Hack. Again, that is such a fun time every year whenever I, I, I get to participate in it. I hope I can find the time to uh, to get in, in on it again this year. Um, but Ed's off doing his own thing now, hopefully uh, talking with Santa Claus and getting stuff <laughs> fired up and ready to go for the launch date. Uh, which may have already passed, depending on when you're listening to this uh, this show and when he gets things live. Um, so, yeah, with any luck, this show is going to air maybe the day after he uh, he goes live. Um, I believe Security Weekly is where you can hear about the actual go-live date, but he didn't say so in the interview, yep. so I don't know. <laughs> so, yep. so uh, it, it, I mean, based on what he said, it, it may be soft-launched. Yeah. By the time this is up. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, HolidayHackChallenge.com. Yep. And just go and see if it's live. Just keep your eyes open. Currently, it's got a picture of two turtle doves. <laughs> All right. So let's move on to announcements and get through the rest of the show. How's that sound? Sounds good to me. So first of all, our uh, our Patreon status has not changed since the last show. Still have our eight patrons, which we thank each and every one of you, no matter how little or how much you're given to us. Um, we're still making like 55 bucks or something a, a month from Patreon, which is covering the hosting very well, which is good. I did, uh, I think I already talked about this. I did up the hosting a little bit so we didn't have as many weird uh, outages on our website and whatnot. Um, and then, of course, the Libsyn fees. So between DigitalOcean and Libsyn, the, the 50 bucks or whatever it is, is that I'm actually getting out of Patreon is covering it nicely. So the more we get, the more improvements we can make to the show, though. So if you're thinking about supporting us, feel free to do so via Patreon, patreon.com slash ironsysadmin. Uh, other announcements. Uh, the DEF CON 610. Have we had a show since the pub crawl? I don't think we have. Um, no. I think our last show no. was just before the have. pub crawl. The pub crawl was a lot of fun. We're calling it a, a, a success. We had like, I don't know, I didn't get a head count, but there were like 20, 25 people showed up, maybe more. Um, I was I was holed up at uh, Two Rivers all night, making sure that things were going well with the scoreboard and whatnot. Um, so I didn't really get to participate in any of the other uh, venues, but uh, it was a good time. We had a lot of people show up. I got to hang out at Two Rivers and drink and eat good food all day, which was, I mean, what more could you ask for, right? <laughs> But yeah, that, uh, that, that does sound like a fun time. Yeah, yeah. We uh, we have a meetup coming up. It looks like it'll be January 8th, 2020, uh, because it normally would have been the first Wednesday, which is New Year's Day, and no one thought that was going to work out. Um, apparently, uh, Danny, who runs the show, uh, bought a... Well, I know he bought an ATM years ago that we were going to poke around at at, uh, at the... Excuse me, at the meetup. And this past month, he actually, or this month, he actually got it to Two Rivers, and I, I assume there was some ATM hacking that went on at the last meetup. I didn't make it to the, the meetup. So maybe there'll be more of that in January. I don't know. Something to look forward to. So, yeah, Jason, you got... Sorry, Another option is to uh, 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 get a group of people together and, and play the uh, Holiday Hack Challenge. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to ask the group about that, unless you already did, and see if, if there's interest in that. I think that'd be a fun thing to do, get together and Holiday Hack on uh, that meetup. Yep. So you've, you've got an announcement in here for Whopper Summit? Yeah, so uh, Whopper Summit is uh, quickly approaching. Uh, it'll be March 27th to the 29th. At, uh, uh, it's in Philadelphia at um, some hotel I can't remember the name of. Uh, but if you're looking for information, uh, whoppersummit.org. And uh, uh, it's more of a hardware-focused conference. Um a little bit of security, a uh, little bit of uh, uh, sort of defense operations type stuff, and and a whole lot of hardware. And uh, um, I don't know uh, what's been announced, so I I can't. Uh, I'm not going to release any information uh, that they they haven't already announced. But uh, some of the talk that's going on in various different guests and and uh, different folks that are going to be there is. Uh, pretty out of this world um if they pull off even half of what they've suggested this year i don't know how they'll top it in the following year so um it, some of the tickets are on sale already um you can go look at the the website uh has links to it um you, you want to be there for this so uh check it out 
That's pretty awesome. Yeah, it looks like it's going to be a lot of fun this year. So that's about it for announcements. Um, I did try to look into reviews. Well, we tried to record this show last night and things fell through, so I looked last night. So maybe a review came in between yesterday and today. Uh, I doubt that, though. <laughs> There's no no new reviews that I saw last night when I checked. Um, so, folks, Leave um, reviews. We need yeah, reviews. We'll, uh, we'll tell you the Do same thing we say every week. The more feedback we get from listeners, uh, the more we know, you know what you want out of the show. So we will take your silence as um, approval. <laughs> so if you something you don't like about the show, let us know. Otherwise, we're just going to keep doing the thing that bothers you. <laughs> Uh, even if you do like the show the way it is, put that in a review so that, you know, it, yes. it gets out there. Yeah, that would be helpful. Um, reviews actually help because it, it sort of gets the content, floats it up in the stacks or whatever, and more people can see it, yada, yada. But, um, I mean, we're not here to make money. We're here to sort of get the yeah. content out there. But it's it's always fun to have more, like knowing that more people are listening. Yeah, um, yeah. Rather and than just shouting to the void. Yeah, not just that, but um, even if even if our goal is just to spread the message, the more people that are listening, the more message we're spreading, right? <laughs> yeah. So, um, I, I mean, I, uh, like, what was it, a year, year and a half ago, we came, we, we got a new listener, and they're like, oh, yeah, we heard about you on Reddit. And we're like, Reddit? <laughs> and it turned out that we'd been included in some list of sysadmin podcasts on some post on Reddit. And we're like, oh, that's awesome. So hearing that really gave gave me anyway a, like a, a great pat on the back that someone actually not only liked the show but liked it enough to include it in this list and people were hearing about the show that way. So that sort of stuff really really helps. So you know, share the show however you want to, uh, and if you find things you don't like about the show, let us know so we can improve. Here, here, uh, yeah. <clears throat> so uh, that's it for reviews or us begging for reviews. Um, let's see. Oh, I picked up a new thing. So I think I talked about it on the show a little bit ago, but like three, four months ago, Google announced this cool new product, um, that they were going to be releasing in November called Stadia. And it's basically a, uh, a, a game streaming platform. And, uh, I, I pre-ordered it not three, four months ago, I pre-ordered it like a month and a half ago. And it arrived, I don't know, last week, I think it was, the week before. And I've been playing it quite a bit since. It's really cool. I just, I have to say, it's really cool. And I've heard, I think Microsoft is toying with a similar technology. And what was the other one? NVIDIA, I think, is toying with something similar where they're doing a streaming platform. Um, But I haven't touched either of those. But Stadia, I have. And I just have to say that it had a little bit of a rocky start. I mean, if you think about it, so that... The way this works is there is a server somewhere in Google's data center or in Google Cloud or whatever that's playing your game and rendering it there and then just piping the output to you just like it would stream a movie or something. However, of course, this is an interactive movie, right, where you're inputting through a controller, which I don't have them on my desk now, but there's a controller that connects to your Wi-Fi in your house and then it talks to a Chromecast that's connected to your TV. And between the Chromecast and the controller, they're able to set up this link over your Wi-Fi um, that is good enough to play first-person shooters and, like, Twitch games. And um, I played through all of, um, what was it, 2013's Tomb Raider? Remember when they re-released Tomb Raider back in 2013? They sort of yeah. re- rebooted the series. Yep. Um, that's a, That was up there for 10 bucks, so I bought it because I like the game anyway. I already have it on PS3. I didn't really have to buy it. I could have just played it on PS3, but I thought... It'd be a good test of this of the system, and I literally I had trouble putting it down. It was that playable. It was fun. It was enjoyable. It was. I had a, a glitch or two, you know, where like the the controller didn't respond just right, or had a couple cases where the controller sort of disconnected, and I had to uh, reconnect. Um, one or two graphics glitches that were completely a thing that you could ignore unless you were really looking for them and trying to pick them out, but. It worked really well, I, I have to say. It's been really cool. Um, I don't know. We'll see where it goes. They have a very small subset of games right now, which is kind of disappointing, but it's also a very new service. And I'd imagine games have to be reworked in some way to be compatible with this system. So I guess we'll see as things unfold, but uh, i got to say it was fun. And 
the very idea that I was playing on a system somewhere in the cloud, um, unless I knew it was doing it, I would think it was rendering it locally on this Chromecast, which I know is impossible. <laughs> but that's how playable it was. That's how unnoticeable the uh, the lag was. So I got to say, pretty cool. And if uh, if Google did this this good of a job on it, I got to imagine that someone like Microsoft will do an equally good job with their their Xbox offering. I am right. I'm not I'm not wrong there. Did, did, was it you told me that Xbox is doing this, or did I read it somewhere else? Yeah, they're they're doing a. I think they're calling it X Cloud. Yeah. Um, they're doing something similar. Um, I don't know how. It's, I mean, I imagine it's going to be basically the same idea. Um, but it's supposed to launch sometime next year, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, obviously you need a decent, um, you need a decent internet connection for that to work. Yeah, um, I've got, what was it, a hundred megabit cable modem? Which I'm sure Jason will tell me that my hundred megabit cable modem with this particular cable provider is not a hundred megabit. <laughs> uh, I know my cable modem has been crap lately, so. Yeah, mine's. Um, I don't know what's going on, but. Uh, mine's been a little weird the past couple days, but before that, which I have not been playing Stadia the last couple days, so. Maybe that has a lot to do with it, but, um, but yeah, 100 megabit cable. I do have gigabit in the house, not 10 gig or anything crazy, just gigabit. Um, but I was playing over Wi-Fi. You know, the, the Chromecast was connected to Wi-Fi, the controller was connected to Wi-Fi, um, and even let me think, I was playing on my laptop for a little bit. That's another cool feature of the the system. You can plug the controller into your laptop USB, and you can play in a browser, just Chrome. Uh, that was on Ethernet. Um, so that of course would have benefited from the local bandwidth, but yeah, over Wi-Fi, I was doing the, the Chromecast and it worked really well. And it was, Google actually said, don't do it over Wi-Fi. They said, connect it because the, the, the Chromecast ultra that you need to play, it does have an ethernet connection. They're like, connect it over ethernet. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to try it on Wi-Fi and see what happens. <laughs> it worked really well. So. So yeah, that's my very brief review of Stadia. Sounds like fun. I'll have to check it out if I can ever get over there. It did. Um, so this month I did two things. One was Stadia and the other was I looked for a cloud backup provider because now that I'm working remotely, I don't have an office to store my backup in anymore. I used to back it up, back up my laptop to a hard drive and store that in my office at work. Um, I went with Spider Oak. And of course, then I had to kick off my initial backup of two things. One is my machine that I store all my stuff on and the other is my laptop. And together, it's like a terabyte and a half. Um, so that ate up a lot of my bandwidth cap, which is my cable provider so happily imposes on us. And then that combined with Stadia, I literally was like, I don't know, 50 meg away from my cap at the end of my, <laughs> at the end of my, uh, so what? another, another customer of the same service told me the other day that they got rid of the caps. No, they're still there. That's what I thought. Yeah, I actually um, just a couple days ago decided that with the cloud backups running and if I'm going to keep using Stadia, I actually went to a higher package because not necessarily because the speed wasn't there, but because I wanted a slightly higher bandwidth cap. So, yeah, they're still there. <laughs> okay. Anyway, not that most of the listeners care about that. <laughs> So, do you have any uh, interesting projects going on, or are you just busy being uh, busy with work? Built a shelf. You built the shelves! They're done! That's well, right. Mostly. Yeah, we I talked. got one piece left that's over there, but you can't see it, so ha. You and I talked about this last night, and then it didn't become a show, so no one knows. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so after uh, after a long time, I finally got the shelves built. Um, got most of my stuff on the shelves, uh, and then... Uh, once I get the other shelf piece, which is that. Hey, now we can there. see it. So the, this piece is, still needs to be, uh, painted and sanded and everything. But once that's in there, then the shelves that are down the side are usable and not just hanging there. Um, pretty cool. And then everything comes in and, and, and it's done. Well, nice work, man. They um, came out nice. I have a floor now. I can move around my office. It's really weird. It is weird. I'm going to have to come over someday and have a look at these. They look really nice. Yeah, yeah. Thankfully, my father's a woodworker and he told me what to do. So I can't take, 
Can't take all the credit for it. That's the way to do it. That's the way to do it. All right, so shall we move on into the news? News. News. We start with the news here. Oh, the hacker news. We got. Oh, this is the uh, the the weird VPN kernel bug. Kernel bug? Linux bug? Whatever. All right. So this article is from the Hacker News, and I actually heard about it on a call that I had with some other you know fellow Red Hatters, and that's why I figured I'd include it in the show. Uh, we could probably spend the rest of the show discussing the implications of this bug. Uh, the title is "New Linux Bug." Yeah, new Linux bug. Let's attackers hijack encrypted VPN connections. That's that title is a little vague. Um, you and I chatted about this quite a bit, but basically what it comes down to is there is a flaw. People are blaming it on System D, but it's not necessarily System D. Um, uh, what was the word again? You you had looked all into this last night. It's the, it's not it's not a, it's hard to say that it's a flaw. It's how TCP/IP works. Right. So um, there's there's these there's a filter called a reverse pass filter. Reverse path filter. That's the word I was blanking um, on. <laughs> yeah. So basically, um, if you turn this on in in strict mode, what it does is, well, it will automatically drop any packet that comes from a source that, uh, according to the local routing table, the data can't come from. So if I'm talking to Nate um, and I suddenly get a message from Nate that comes through my window, I ignore that because Nate's not on the other side of my window and I know that. Um, so what what seems to have happened here is that they've modified the RP filter and switched it to loose mode, um, which isn't quite as uh, obviously restrictive um, right. in accepting where those connections come from. Right. So what happens is when you're on a VPN, the data comes over the tunnel um, and is then decrypted when it hits your end. And on your side, you have a virtual IP uh, that, it, that represents your end of the VPN tunnel. The other side has a, 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 another IP. So when, when they have this set to loose, what's happening is an attacker who has to be on the same network, by the way, um, yep. Can send can basically flood you with packets, claiming to be the other side. Um, and if they hit the right combination, they hit the right IP, and and through that they can get a response. So you set basically you're sending um, Synac packets, um, and once you get the right right address, it will respond. This that your uh, the the victim's computer will respond with a reset to you. Now you know you have the right address. And from there, you can start doing using different techniques to try to start sneaking information out. Eventually, you can get the, um, the sequence numbers and take over the connection. Um, yeah. And if I'm understanding it correctly, you, you're hijacking the connection, but it's still actually going through the victim's computer. So it's not like you're taking it out of that tunnel. Because if you take it out of the tunnel, it's there's no guarantee, first of all, that you can get there. And secondly, the, the other end is going to notice that it's now talking to a different endpoint. Um, so you can you can use these techniques to sort of like steal that that connection and, and do some some nasty things. Yes, it means that you can you can get data from the VPN. Yes, it means that it's going to come to you unencrypted. Um, and yeah, it is a security problem. Um, but this is if you are on, like, again, the attacker has to be or has to have the ability to send traffic on your local network. Yeah, so I could imagine a case where, I mean, one could be you literally have a device on your home network that has been compromised in some way. That's right. probably not uh, as, as likely a use case as right. something like I'm at the coffee shop yep. sharing Wi-Fi with somebody else yep. who is trying to do this. Or um, in like a, a targeted attack, it could be that somebody is spoofing Wi-Fi. You know, I'm on my corporate network Wi-Fi. 
somebody is spoofing a uh, an AP that looks like my corporate Wi-Fi, and now they can. But I mean, there's all kinds of nasty stuff you can do then, and there's all kinds of nasty stuff you can do in the in the coffee shop scenario, right? So this is just one more thing. Um, and this is this is a this is a fairly advanced attack. This is not yeah you know Joe Script Kitty is not going to sit there and and run this against you at least not yet. Well, once it's once it's been appropriately weaponized yeah. and scripts have been built around it, maybe. But this is this is not a simple attack. Yeah, and it's it sounds like the fix is not uh, simply to turn off to, to set it back to strict mode either. Like that's that may work, but there's there's talk so, that that won't help with v six. I right, guess because so V6 IPv6, implements it differently or whatever. Um, and I don't I don't know enough about this to be able to talk too intelligently about it. Um, but from the little bit that I have been able to uncover, so IPv4 is pretty straightforward. Um, if you have RP filter turned on and it's strict, you you block this. End of story. Yeah. Um, IPv6, that may not be the case. And it's not necessarily the case because... Um, I don't know that the RP filters work the same way in in V6. There's there's I, I, there's something different there, and I know that um, there were a couple article or a couple um, bug reports that I ran across where RP filters weren't yet implemented. I mean, this was a couple of years ago, but um, so it should be there, but maybe it's not working the exact same way that it does in V4. Um, that said, V6 is fairly. Uh, it's not something that's used very often in the U.S. Um, overseas, much more, uh, but not very often in the U.S. Of course, it also means that most people in the U.S. are not looking for it, and yeah. as and as any any uh, seasoned and uh, network engineer knows, V6 is a completely different stack, and just yeah. because you have all of those firewalls and filters and everything else on your V4 stack. You may not have anything on V6. Yeah, and if V6 is on by default and you don't know it, and it's doing all kinds of dynamic address and, allocation and, it is and whatever, in a lot of cases. Yeah. yeah, now all of a sudden you've got a whole network that's sort of a shadow of your existing network that you weren't looking right. at. <laughs> right. Yep. So, so yeah, it's something to be aware of. Um, I don't know what they're. I haven't seen any quote unquote fixes for this yet. I'm curious to see what exactly comes out. Um. But there's so there's the the article that we initially talked about, and then there's a secondary article. That's not even an article. There's a, a link to a mailing list um, that Nate put in here that has uh, uh, really really good information on yeah. exactly what's going on, including a a full uh, uh, way to reproduce this entire thing. So, um, yeah, it's, the. Uh... The Hacker News article also has a list of a number of systems that they tested this against, you know, that, that they yep. are, in fact, vulnerable. Um, RHEL 8 is not uh, susceptible. <laughs> I just have to say that. <laughs> RHEL 8 is not on the list. I don't know that it's not susceptible. Well, no, according to the, the, the conversations we had, it's because... So they, they mentioned that there's a certain release of System D that uh, switched this. Right. And Rail 8 doesn't use that release. It's it was previous to that because of the version of Fedora that it was based off of. Um, okay. So it's uh, it's, and, and it's not like we did anything to make sure it wasn't <laughs> susceptible. Right. It was pure luck. <laughs> and this is this is not this is not limited to Linux, by the way, because no. FreeBSD and OpenBSD are also susceptible to this. Yep, FreeBSD, well OpenBSD. As... I I think I heard that Mac OS is susceptible as well. It's just differently susceptible. That's... Yeah, as well as um, some other operating systems. Some that I recognize are Linux because they say Linux in the name, and some that I have no idea what these are. I've never heard of them. Um, Manjaro, which I think is a Linux. Yeah, well, it says Dev System One. D next to it. Dev yeah, One. Yeah, Dev One, which is which is which is SysV, which which is yeah. De wasn't Dev the One Unix variant? Dev One was the was it um, Debian fork? When Debian switched to um, System D and people had a fit, maybe wasn't that um, it? It's possible. And then there's one called Deepin. You've never heard of Deepin? No. no. Uh, Deepin is a. It's actually gotten quite a bit of press lately. Um, first of all, it's released or backed by uh, Huawei, which made me a little 
skeptical of it. <laughs> oh. But okay. it apparently has a beautiful UI, which is what oh, yeah, what people have noticed. Um, so. So yeah. Yeah, no, pretty. I don't know what Void Linux okay. is. I've never heard of that one. I'm over it already. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, I them. I ran the deep in UI very briefly on. In fact, this laptop that I'm on right now, and it's neat. Um, it's just another window manager. Uh, whatever. If you're into pretty window managers, I've stuck with GNOME simply because it's what comes with the distro and it works. <laughs> I'm, I'm really into the window manager that works. I yeah, really exactly. Like this one works. Like I, I, I spent a very long time in my early days in Linux trying to get uh, Enlightenment working. You remember Enlightenment? Enlightenment. Oh is, yeah, it's gorgeous. It's beautiful. It's absolutely gorgeous. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, I, I literally a cluster of cray computers to make it work. Yeah. Yeah. You used to have to build the whole thing from source and being a new guy on Linux, it was a very, very steep learning curve. I mean, I learned a lot trying to get it to work and I did eventually get it to work and I've used it once or twice over the years, but as beautiful as it is, it's just not worth the hassle. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I can, I can build my Fedora system from a DVD uh, it has GNOME 3 running out of the box, and I know a couple tweaks to make GNOME 3 a little more usable. I do those, and then I move on. <laughs> yep. yep. I, 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 I like my Mac. I'm good with that. Yeah, yeah. I still have the uh, the MacBook that the college let me keep when I left, and I use that um, as a basically day-to-day -day machine um, because it is good for that. And I use it for all my video editing because all my Adobe Creative Suite stuff is on there. But, uh, yeah, speaking of Apple. Speaking, speaking of Macs, yep. <laughs> I don't know. We talked back and forth about whether to even include this article because it's kind of meh. It sounds, it sounds very, very, so it's from Forbes. It sounds like it's, it's so sinister when you read the, the title. New Apple security update could scrap your old MacBook. Here's what you do. So when I read that, I read it as, I have an old MacBook. Is there some software update that's coming that's going to break it on me? Oh, no, what should I do? And then I started reading it, and it's really about um, the security chip that is built into newer MacBooks, right? Right. So any any of the newer MacBooks, um, which I think are 20, I don't think the 2017s, it might have been the 2018s, any, anything that has the T2 um, chip in it, yeah. Um, which is the security chip, which, by the way, is basically the same thing or, or same type of chip that is in your iPhone and your iPad, um, right. and the same type of chip that is in other devices. Um, so these chips exist in uh, um, lots of different Windows uh, machines. Oh yeah, um, yeah, yeah. This, this isn't. They, this is this, not a new idea. Yeah. Um, Any I, anything. I, Anything that boasts that it will brick itself if someone tries to break into it probably has a chip like this in it. And right. uh, the the idea is, or I should say what the article is going on about is refurbishers and um, people who fix old hardware and whatnot. If I take my MacBook and just turn it off and pitch it or give it to somebody and I don't do anything to prepare it before I do so, like I don't wipe it, um, the person who receives it will have a very hard time getting into it, and in the process of doing so, could brick the thing. Now, obviously not right. my MacBook, because my MacBook doesn't have that chip in it, um, but the uh, the newer MacBooks. And it's I right. can understand how it's a valid... It's like, I, I see both sides of the argument. On one side, you have security that says, I don't want people to be able to get into this MacBook that hasn't been wiped, because that could mean it's stolen. Right. right or whatever, some nefarious thing. Someone's trying to break into your laptop because that's what it looks like if you've given someone a laptop you haven't wiped. But on the other hand, because I've done things like someone gives me an old MacBook or an old whatever, and I do something to repair it because they thought it was worthless, and then I have a MacBook. <laughs> right. right? <laughs> so, so, so here's here's the difference between, and, and this this goes for like your your iPhone and your iPad as well. So when you when you go and get a new phone um, and you trade in your old iPhone or your old iPad, um, they, they, if they're smart, uh, they will make sure that you have gone in and turned off the find my feature. Yeah. Um, that find my feature is what locks that chip. 
and and by turning it off you're wiping the data that's on there so that so that somebody else can then program it right. this is the same thing that's happening in the Macs so the difference between the MacBook and how it does it and say uh, say a ThinkPad um, because ThinkPads also have these security chips in them or can have the security chips in them they're optional mm -hmm. in a lot of these devices. The difference is that in a MacBook, it's integrated into the system. You can't remove it. It's right. that way on purpose for, for not only for the fact that it's a security chip and you can put fingerprints and passwords and everything else in there, um, but it's also an anti-theft device. Right. That's part of the reason that it's there. Yeah. Um, and part of the reason that you can't remove it. Contrast that to a ThinkPad where if you junk a ThinkPad without wiping that chip um, or that ThinkPad is stolen... All the attacker has to do now, if they pull the chip out and you're actually using the chip for Windows, um, you've, you've now destroyed Windows. You can't get the data off of it. Yeah. Which is exactly what you would want. Yeah. Um, yeah. But they can just put a new chip in or not put a chip in at all and the hardware works fine. Yeah. Right. I so mean, you, you it, could argue that's not a bad model. Like as if, no. if it's if it's getting rid of the sensitive data, which is really what you want to protect. Like if someone steals my laptop, I'm not sure. Like, yes, I will care that now I no longer have my laptop. But what I'll really care about is the data that's on it. And if whatever procedure they go through to make the laptop usable again also wipes my data, then I'll feel a little better about that than if they didn't right. if, if it didn't wipe the data. Right. But um, I would be willing to bet that the majority of thefts of phones, tablets, laptops is to then flip the hardware and make money on it. Not yeah. They don't care about your data. You're right. All. You're right. And and the way that Apple is doing this is makes it a deterrent to deter. Yeah. Theft. Yeah. That's yeah. All. No, I, I get that. And I was about to go in that direction. And you started saying the same thing. That what the the direction Apple is going is not just to protect your data, but to protect your data and to deter theft, which is not not a bad idea, right? But there no, is a trade off, no, and, and this article is all about that trade off and how, um, you know, refurbishers are going to have trouble or could have trouble. But really, what it comes down to are, is they're high value targets. Um, I watched, well, I was involved in an investigation where somebody had stolen. I think it was somewhere between half a dozen and a dozen oh, yeah. Apple MacBooks. Oh, because listen, that's there. You know, if I can take a three, if I can, if I can steal a two thousand dollar device and flip it for five hundred or a thousand dollars, great. Yeah. Three you, or you four. Can't do that with a ThinkPad. Three or four years ago, I wanted to get myself a new laptop, personal laptop, and I looked very hard at a MacBook because I just wanted you know a thing that would be decently powerful that I can use at home, and uh, I wanted to get one for my wife as well because her because she had an old laptop that we wanted to replace, and I just could not bring myself to spend the money on a MacBook on two MacBooks. It was over three thousand dollars for two for two MacBooks, uh, one of which being a little more powerful and one of which being like a MacBook Air, right? Um, so I bought two Dells, <laughs> right? There's a reason that MacBooks are desirable. Part of that is because of the price tag that that Apple puts on them. Um, whether you call that worth it or not, I don't know. That's a whole other discussion. But yeah, I could easily see how they are uh, a target for theft because they are valuable to start with. And the resale value, I'd assume, is there as well. So yeah, yeah they're so, desirable. I mean, the The moral of the story is if you have an Apple device, just make sure you turn off Find yeah. My whatever before you get rid of it if you're looking for that to be used again. And that, I believe, and happens when you do a data a factory data reset. Because I recently did this on an Apple device, and I remember um, my Apple ID telling me that that Find My device was disabled on that device when I did it. Right. So. And by all means, like, please recycle your devices. Yeah. If you can. Yeah. Um, don't just don't just pitch them because you think they're not going to be worth it to anybody else. <laughs> yeah. I mean, hell, resell them. You know. Yeah. Like, I mean, most I Apple have... devices have a lot of life left in them when people are ready to replace them to, to the right person. You know, someone My who MacBook someone who is can't. A 2015, I believe. Yeah, mine's like a 15 um, or 16, and it's working great for what I use what I use it uh, for. Yeah, and 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 I had a 2007 up until a year or two ago. Yep. Um, and the only reason I got rid of it is because I ended up with a 2015 for work. Yeah, mine was an 08, 
and um, I used it up until uh, work got me the 20, I think it's a 2016. And then when I left there, they said I could keep it, so I kept it. <laughs> you know, yeah. I still use my Dell for stuff like this, and I run Linux on it, and I use use it for gaming for Windows. Um, but I do all my video editing and audio. I edit this podcast on the MacBook. I copy it off of this machine and onto the MacBook, and that's where I do all my editing because it's just better for it. It, it handles it better. Anyway, that's enough about my hardware choices. <laughs> all right, moving on to uh, our favorite... Uh, uh, oh, picking. the Fortnite article. I included this just because it's a great... Uh, circle back to an article we covered like a year and a half ago. I don't know if you remember, Jason. I'm sure you do because we talked about it. But I, for the benefit of the listeners, let's let's review this. Uh, about a year and a half ago, we covered an article where what is it? Epic, right? Epic Games. Epic Games. Yep. That uh, that creates the game Fortnite. Uh, they had finally built an Android version of Fortnite, and they're ready to release it. And they didn't like the fees that. Um, Google charges uh, when you do microtransactions within the game um, when you s- distribute it through the Google Play Store. You have to use Google's payment transaction system, which I'm sure from Google's perspective is not just because they're money hungry. I'm sure it's a security feature so they can control payments, right? Um, because that's, you know, sensitive data. So uh, Fortnite, or not Fortnite, Epic decided they're not going to release their game through the Google Play Store. They're going to release it directly, which means you have to degrade the security on your Android device to install it. You have to turn on unknown sources, which is a thing you have to enable developer options to do so with, uh, which means that any APK file that you install from that point on does not have to be digitally signed by Google, which means it did not go through Google's vetting process Argue all you want about whether that process is worth a damn or not. Um, It's there for a reason. They sign it to say, yes, we've tested this thing, and it should be safe for your phone. And this Um, was a a huge success, right? It it was perfect launch. They had no problems. I don't even know. Um, I didn't follow it. (laughs) Nobody ever came up with a a version that wasn't exactly Fortnite. There were never any problems with security. Yeah, I mean, we, we talked about that at length the night we talked about this article. And I tried to look up which episode it was we talked about it on, and I couldn't find it, but um, it's there somewhere. Just go listen to every episode until you hear us talk about Fortnite. You'll hear it. Yeah. Um, about a year and a half ago. <laughs> so anyway, um, Epic has now uh, circled back, and they're basically like, you know, Google, maybe we will use your payment system. Maybe that maybe this was a bad idea. And uh, what what do you say? What how about we play nice, and you just waive those thirty percent fees that um, that you charge everybody else because we're epic, right? And you don't want to. Do, we're going to play nice no, with no, you. No, you no, should no, you no, should no, play no. nice with us. No, no. You got to read what they said. Epic oh. doesn't seek a special exception for ourselves. Except Rather, they, except that they do. We <laughs> expect to see a general change to smartphone industry practices in this regard. So sure. we're not, they're not asking for themselves, but they, they would like everybody to benefit from this. Right. Course, starting now, with Epic. Let's let's ignore the fact that that would probably be a huge hit to whatever revenue Google gets out of the Google Play Store. Um, that's up to Google to decide. And I'm sure Google has plenty of money. They can afford that, right? 30% of every transaction that goes through the Google Play yeah, Store. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure they could. They, that, that would be like a drop in the bucket to them. Yep. Um, so uh, guess what? Uh, Google said no. What I, what I find <laughs> even better about all this is that in the same, basically the same breath that they're saying, we don't seek a special exception for ourselves. We want to change the smartphone industry practices and make it better. Literally in the next paragraph, they're basically threatening them, saying, we believe this form of tying of, of a mandatory payment service with a 30% fee is illegal. Illegal. Yeah. So we, we, we're not asking for a special exception. Um, but we're going to threaten uh, you with this is illegal. illegal. And yeah. If you don't do it, we're going we're gonna to sue you. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, never mind. Now, this isn't in the article. We, we talked about this last night. Now, never mind, though, that Apple does a very similar thing to anything that's released on the Apple Store. Right? The Apple App Store? Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's exactly the same from what I understand. It's 30%. Yeah, so why are they attacking? Like, one, uh, they released Fortnite under the Apple uh, App Store. 
like back when they were arguing with Google about this and they decided to release the APK separately, they went ahead and released Fortnite uh, through the Apple App Store. Yeah. Probably because on iPhone, you just have no choice. Right. You can't turn off or turn on unknown sources on an Apple device because Apple's like, no, that's a bad idea. We're not going to let you do that. That degrades the security right. you of your to, phone. You have to jailbreak your phone to be able to do that. Yeah, yeah, right. So uh, on Android, you don't have to jailbreak it, but you have to turn on developer options, but it still degrades the security of your device. And that's a bad thing. Like, you don't have to root the thing. You just have to turn off this this uh, security feature. Um, so I guess because that was an easy enough thing to do, Epic said, okay, well, we're going to do that for Android. I guess it didn't work out so well for them, though. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I guess not. So, so yeah, um, maybe it's available on the, the Google Play Store now. Um, yeah, this uh, honestly, the last update was, of, was 12.9... Let me refresh the article and see if it has another update to it. No. no. Yeah, no. There's a nice uh, video at the bottom about uh, their experience with Stadia, though. Yep, <laughs> yep, there is. Yeah, there's also a, there's also a blip here from them about how Epic runs their own uh, PC store, major PC storefront, and they don't tie, they don't force developers to use their payment ecosystem, so why should anybody else? Well, whatever, it's their choice. Um, yeah, no, no, and and what's <laughs> funny is that Epic Epic's uh, Epic's PC storefront, if you will, has been uh, uh, a source of controversy for other reasons, anyway. So yeah, um, yeah, it's 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 been interesting. Um, but yeah, this is this is pretty much typical Epic these days. So yep, and um, let's see, we're doing okay on time, right? Or do you need to get moving? No, we're good. We can, okay. we can do uh, one one last uh, one last story, uh, we sticking got... with the uh, theme of video games. Yeah, this one's from Medium. Medium is one of these blog, one of these places where they accept contributions from various authors, isn't it? It's basically a blogging platform. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay, so uh, Medium, right? So uh, architect uh, architects are playing with the future of design in video games. Um, the story starts off with a really um, like fun little story about uh, a team of folks that called themselves what the grannies, the grannies, yep. In uh, Red Dead Online, how they found like a glitch in the world, and then they they like basically broke out of whatever online world um, the game developer put you into, and like f of course what they found was as anyone who's ever turned on no clip mode in Doom <laughs> can tell you, they found a bunch of, you know, polygons and badly drawn things and eventually a lake where they all, uh, uh, they all drown. <laughs> yeah, well, what's interesting is that um, in, in this specific case, it didn't, it didn't immediately go into polygons. It actually continued the world. Yeah. Um, and eventually, you know, further out, weird stuff started happening with some of the textures um, and and where where things weren't matched up and, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, so it, mo modern modern game engines handle clipping a little bit differently. Yeah. Um, yeah. That was a joke. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So so where it used to be like when you clip through <laughs> in Doom or Quake or whatever um, and in a lot of other games. Uh, you, you didn't walk into another world. Yeah, so you you, walking, you, you fell. And yeah, you or fall or forever. you you went into like a void, yeah. right, where right. maybe you weren't falling, yep. but there was no world around you. You were just sort of clipping right. through walls and polygons and whatever. So yeah, this so is a much this, different story than that. Yes, <laughs> what this is talking about is is they've sort of found um, uh, beauty on the other side of the the clipping zone, where the you know it was just a huge uh, ranging um, fields and, and mountain ranges in the distance. And uh, uh, there's actually a link in this article that ends up on Kotaku um, that has uh, 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 screenshots of what they saw, which is, and it's pretty cool. That's cool. I'll have um, to check that out after the show. I didn't notice it. But what they're, what they're kind of going and talking about in this particular article is that um Game developers are starting to, and, and and starting is really not the answer. I mean, they, they've been doing this forever, um, but they're they're using games to build 
new architectures and sort of experiment with how things look and and how things are laid out um sometimes subtly and sometimes in in the extreme yeah and i guess the uh the the point or at least the the point of the summary that i read on slash dot <laughs> which is where i found this article uh was that you know you're not bound by physics in in something like a video game you get to create right. the world in the way that you want to which means the sky's the limit. You're, whatever your, creat- your creativity is. Now, obviously, if you want to apply that to something in the real world, you know you need to stick to physics. But um, right. this gives you the ability to sort of play with reality um, in a way that you can't outside of a computer or outside of a, of a virtual world, which is kind of neat. I mean, it's it's not something brand new. People have been using computer assisted drawing for thirty, forty years. Um, but th- I guess this is just kind of the next step, right? Right. Right. Um, sort of just, you know, it's, it's a lot cheaper to throw crazy architectures together in a virtual space than it is to do it in, in meat space. Yep. Yep. All that laws um, of physics I, crap. You'll see, and this is already starting to happen, but you'll see this, uh, extend to, uh, uh, both VR and AR. Um, and AR is where it actually gets really interesting because they... I've seen um, at least one, uh, it's more an art installation than anything, but um, where they use AR and map um, additional architecture or modify the architecture of buildings Hmm. um, where you can walk up and look at it with, you know, your phone or an AR goggles or whatever. And you're looking at a real building and they've, they've changed the architecture on the building. Um, And, done properly you, you really can't tell the difference uh, until cool. you try to touch it yeah right why does my hand go through the yeah yeah, yeah. you fall you fall out the window that's not really there ah. that sort of thing. yeah so uh did you see this is kind of related did, did you see um microsoft has released a new minecraft game that is ar yeah minecraft earth yeah looks kind of neat i'm, I'm looking it's, it's interesting it's yeah i played around with it a little bit it's uh it's not, you have to play it for a while before it becomes more free form, but it's not as free form as just Minecraft. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's, I don't know. They, they added sort of the kind of like the Pokemon Go type stuff where you have to, you have to move around and find different things in the world to. Yeah. Get, well, that's the um, whole point of an AR game at this point. That's, that's yeah. the model they're all following. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's, it's not like the demos that I saw where it was, you know, Point your phone, say go, and boom, you've got Minecraft and you can go crazy. Yeah. Um, this is this is more, you know, specific sets of things that you can do in different places. Yeah. Um, it is neat. It is neat. Yeah, it looks um, looks pretty neat. And my, my kids are really into Minecraft and um the uh the the cheap well not the cheap ish Android tablets that I got for them so that they can do things, you know, with uh, don't it's not supported on those platforms yet. So I'm looking forward to when it is, and then hopefully they can they can enjoy that in the house and you know around the property and stuff. I don't want to see my kids mindlessly walking into traffic to play Minecraft though, which is the the fear everyone had around Pokemon Go if you remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there's a there's another game. Um, I don't know what the game is called, um, but I saw a video of it. It's for the Oculus Quest, I believe. Hmm. Um, and basically, it's a... It was wild. So uh, you go into... You need a huge room. Empty. Completely empty, huge room. So basically, like a, a, a garage or um, a warehouse. Gymnasium. And yeah, <laughs> you put on your, you put on your, your Oculus Quest um, and tell it to go. And you're playing against another player. So okay. two people are in the room and it builds a labyrinth. Oh, wow. Right. So you, you're playing in a completely empty space and it builds all the walls and everything around you. Wow. Uh, and you're basically running through the labyrinth trying to shoot each other. And, so it's like a laser tag uh, game. Kind of. Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of cool. And it, yeah, it, you saw the video from the point of view of the players and it looks like they're running through like, you know, hallways and, and all sorts of 
all over the place. And then, then it Very pans out to this empty room. And then you see the, with two right, people you see running the video around. of them playing outside of it, and they're just running around in the warehouse, and they can't, see, you know, you can't see each other. Yeah. Uh, and it's wild. It is. It's really neat. That's pretty um, cool. So I, I'm, I'm really, is, uh, I'm really waiting for the time that computer games and um, physical fitness don't have to be mutually exclusive. <laughs> It's it's we're getting there. Of, it's some of it's there already. You we're know, getting my there. son has um, uh, what does he have? Uh, Gear VR, I think it is. Yeah. Um, and uh, they play uh, uh, Beat Saber, which is just a that game is um, crazy. It's lightsabers. Yeah, if you haven't seen I've, it. It's I've, lightsabers. I've, yeah, and you're playing to the music, and you're basically like chopping to the music. There are. Um, there are a ton, well, I mean, not a ton. There are several uh, YouTube channels that have cropped up just yeah. of people playing Beat Saber, yeah. and yeah, it is and it is oddly satisfying to watch. And he will <laughs> he will walk out of playing Beat Saber for a half hour drenched in sweat. Yeah, the one I saw, it, it was is... like um, they had worked a squat routine into Beat yep. Saber. So, like, basically, yep. it, the act of playing the game was a squat routine. Because you yeah, had because to squat down to do a thing. There's and, blocks that yeah, come over. Yeah. You, you have to dodge. You yeah. have to squat. Yeah, it's, it's pretty it's cool. Crazy. Um, and uh, we watched, they played another game. Um, it's some sort of a, uh, it's like a mystery game. You have to like solve some puzzles and all sorts of stuff. And yeah. the kids are playing. And um, it's the funniest thing I've ever seen. So he's playing the game and he got tired. So he leaned on the table. Yeah. There was no table. <laughs> so uh you know he ended up on the floor uh, yeah well it was, the it was, it was quite humorous the video i saw of the squat routine one um this girl was playing it and she did like 430 squats in in, in five minutes or something or two minutes or whatever it was and at the end she literally just fell over because her legs were so wasted from oh yeah <laughs> but she she did it for the channel to see if she could actually finish it right it wasn't so this wasn't right. like her normal workout routine she was like i'm gonna do this and yeah she like fell over at the end <laughs> <laughs> then couldn't walk for two days probably i bet she was like <laughs> like in traction for three days <laughs> yeah. so so yep and that uh that 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 polishes off the rest of the news that closes the news all right cool now the timer's just about two minutes we hit or yeah two minutes two hours you know the usual <laughs> yep <laughs> all right and our What's that? Our next uh, our, our next recording is going to be uh, what is it? The day after uh, Christmas? Is it? I don't know. I haven't even looked. Yeah, I think that's it the might date be. That it's supposed to be the twenty sixth. We're not going to do that. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I actually, um, I'll be working that day, so I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Yeah. <laughs> we'll figure it I'll out. Probably be working too. We'll figure it out. I'll have to I'll have to chat with the rest of you guys and see if we want to try to reschedule that one instead of just skipping it like we did on Thanksgiving. But right. I don't know. I don't feel like we missed that much. Listeners, did you did you feel a void because we didn't record on Thanksgiving? Let us know. I felt a void. <laughs> so I know some podcasts will do it. They'll record Thanksgiving night. I, I think my, my family would mutiny if I did that. <laughs> so anyway, um, roughly you can watch us. Uh, well, I guess we haven't been doing a lot of live lately. I should I should change this uh, this line. Uh, sometimes we're live, sometimes we're not on the second or fourth Thursday of every month. Uh, maybe we'll get back to the lives. Let, let us know if you guys really love watching us live. We, we never really got a, a ton of turnout for those. Um, and it just adds a little bit of stress on show nights. So it's a lot easier for us to record and then release, um, on the right nights. So new episodes on the second and fourth Thursday of just about every month, unless it's Thanksgiving. Um, you can watch, uh, the released videos of our podcast on YouTube, youtube.com slash ironsysadmin, or ironsysadmin podcast, sorry. Uh, you can join our Slack workspace if you'd like to join in and chat with us or give us feedback or just chat with the community. Um, we get some pretty good conversations going on in there from time to time. ironsysadmin.com forward slash Slack. Uh, you can find us on social media, Facebook and Twitter. Just look for Iron Sysadmin, and you can subscribe wherever you would normally find podcasts. If you uh, if you find that we are not listed somewhere, let us know where that is, and we'll try to get that listed. Um, and as mentioned earlier, don't forget you can support the show via Patreon. Iron has been sorry, patreoncom slash has been. And I think that is a wrap. Leave leave reviews. 
Yes. Wherever you can find the podcast, start dropping reviews Give in. Give us review. And it might not hurt to tell us if you left the review, because some of these things might not notify us when you leave a review. <laughs> that would be bad. I'm sure like somewhere like Stitcher, there's probably 127 reviews we've never read. <laughs> I've ever used Stitcher. Neither have I, but the podcast is listed there. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Anyway. All right, folks. Well, thanks for listening, and uh, we will catch you next time. Have a good night, all.